morning um this morning julie whitmore from ypn i'm with sam hill um sam's going to share with his um the story of his incredible background what he's been doing in property so uh good morning sam and welcome great to be working with you thank you very much julie thanks for the inv invitation to come on really nice to be here so tell us a little bit about you sam what 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 was your background and sort of what led you to getting into uh, uh, the field of property um, so background really since I left school was all um, working on the tools really. Um, yeah, various different trades. Um, started off as an electrician. Uh, did that for uh, two years. Didn't really fall in love with it. Um, so I got my basic qualification um, and then I sort of moved from sort of trade to trade after that really for sort of the next, yeah, like I guess 12, 13 years, something like that. So <clears throat> I was doing glazing, I was doing, um, yes, yeah, lots of carpentry work, I would do brickwork, sort of a big mix really. I ended up doing, moving into kind of doing lofts and extensions um, and general kind of um, interior refurbishments really. Um, a lot of kind of second fix stuff, that was my, that was my favorite thing to do really. So were you working for somebody, um, Sam, at the time? Um, a mix, really. Um, I was always subcontracting, really. I never really, um, I always liked doing my own thing and sort of changing up what I wanted to do every sort of few months or a couple of years. So I would generally subcontract out to other builders or I'd just be working with friends or do my own jobs, really. So, yeah, a bit of a mix, really. And, and obviously being self-employed has its own challenges uh doesn't it you know particularly if it's dependent on you being able to be on site to to, to deliver your trade basically indeed yeah yeah always a challenge um yeah i've had a couple of things where you've had uh, broken bones from snowboarding accidents where you're out for work for a couple of months and things like that and it's always a bit of you know, right risky of hobbies with self-employment maybe not yeah. the best the best <laughs> ideas Sam. yeah definitely but there you go you have to do <laughs> um so what tell us a bit about your, your transition how how did that how did that come about um so the the main driver for me really um was something another kind of incident that happened really was um when i was in my early 20s i was stabbed um oh dear. yeah i was attacked so someone stabbed me in the chest uh quite close to my spine um I, yeah lucky to survive it would be a bit of an understatement i think wow <laughs> um yeah sort of unpro unprovoked attack um and yeah just a lot of damage afterwards and yeah operations and plenty going on shall we say um so yeah that was when i was 23 24 and then yeah so i started off in property when i was 30 so that the gap in between me sort of starting off when i was you know getting into property was yeah just struggling sort of physically and, and mentally absolutely um, after what had happened kind of physical at first and then the kind of yeah, the mental sort of struggles afterwards with sort of PTSD, depression, thinking about suicide, all that kind of stuff. Goodness. Uh, yeah, and are you okay what, now? Are you fully recovered from all of that now, Sam? Uh, I'd say, like, yeah, mentally much better, but physically it's still a struggle, really. Um, I've had um, severed nerves because it's quite close to my spine. Um, oh, okay. And a lot, of, a lot of the scar tissue kind of pulls down on one side of my body and it's kind of gives me... Yeah, a lot of grief with standing, walking sometimes, just doing general day-to-day -day stuff, like physical stuff. Sometimes I can do it. It's a bit of a lottery day-to-day, -day, really. Right, so carrying on and being dependent on something that was very physical was was really not practical for you after after this, um, this, yeah. this tragic incident, yeah? Yeah, it became impossible, really. I was sort of... The only way I could uh, deal with it was coming up. I, I do about half an hour to an hour's worth of, of stretching when I was at work during the day, just to be able to carry on with the day. Um, and then, yeah, same in the morning, half an hour's worth of stretching before I left the house and then home at night, same again. And just, you know, you can't carry on doing that and just being in a lot of pain, you know, I just, um, I'd always wanted to do something different. I didn't want to work on the tools my whole life, but I think this kind of, you know, forced me into it probably earlier than I would have, which, hasn't been a bad thing really yeah. right. well <laughs> yeah, positive yeah. Come, 
<laughs> yeah, they say obviously that things things come out of uh, tragic situations, don't they? I mean, incidentally, was was the attacker were, were the consequences off the back of this? Um, no, the police didn't manage to do anything really. So, yeah, couldn't couldn't manage to find anyone. There wasn't much evidence, or you know, and it was right in the middle of Soho as well. So it's amazing they never had any cameras. To, any cameras to mm. found it. And they're all just sort of pointing down the wrong end of the street where it happened. So, yeah. And, and that must be difficult for you because you weren't actually able to get any sense of justice from that, were you? To be honest, I've never really been bothered about it. I've just always decided to just focus on myself and pretty much knew from the start that they weren't going to catch whoever it was. Or I just made that decision in my mind that they probably wouldn't. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I've, yeah, there's been occasional times when I've thought about it, but... It's not something I've ever been stuck on because I just thought I thought to myself, well, there's there's just no point thinking about the other person, you know, whether they can find them or bring them to justice not or something not. you can change, is it really? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I didn't really sort of make that decision just to not sort of focus and spend any time on that really. Okay. So so um obviously this happened, you had to look at adjusting things. Where where did that lead you to, Sam? Yeah, so yeah, I'd say you know, late twenties really. I started, um, yeah, just thinking, you know, I've got to be doing something else. I can't carry on with like how my body is and how I'm feeling day to day. I just, I, I, this can't continue because I'm just going down a path where just this is becoming impossible to deal with um, day to day. Um, mm. So, yeah, I think, yeah, as with you know, a lot of people who work on site, you know, you work for the old developer and you see them turn up in a nice car and have, have a nice life, and you know. That, that always appealed to me before because it just thought yeah just doing something else rather than working on the tools my whole life that would be something i wanted to do um so yeah that just sort of pushed me into it really just to make a decision and get going on it so pretty much just decided one day right i'm going to make this happen now um and yeah as a lot of people do you find your first couple of uh books on property and one of them's from progressive and you know you go to a couple of events and away you go really <laughs> so the events that you, you you attended were they just sort of like one day events did you did you invest in any of the sort of you know the the formal longer term training uh how how, how did that look for you initially uh so yeah i did the the multiple streams of property i think it was oh, called misopi 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 yeah. yeah so that was the first one that was my first experience of you know property and training in, in a weekend so yeah i went to that one um uh yeah so i did that weekend um and i did sign up for a longer term course but i, I just decided it wasn't for me pretty quickly so um yeah stopped with that um and then decided to yeah i was going to do rent to rent really that was a, the option for me because um i made the decision just one day that sort of right i can do this rent to rent thing i can make that happen i need to replace some of my just a bit of my income as a builder um so me being me i just decided to um sell the van one day and decide that was me finished and i was going to get some rent to rents and away we go that was my okay. kind of that so my... you've still obviously got living expenses you know and and, and you know you still got to, to you know to to live while you were doing some of some of this stuff so obviously um yeah quite quite a brave decision to take sam wasn't it yeah it was about uh i think it was a uh, only uh, six months after we bought our first house as well right okay um, yeah with, so, with, with, a, with your partner yeah yeah that's it yeah so we're doing that all up at the same time and i was going through yeah, the decision just to yeah quit and yeah just get stuck into property so you had got a partner so because sometimes it can make a bit of a difference so even though obviously you've got financial risk you'd still got somebody there that was giving you some of that emotional type support sort of thing with what you were doing yeah very much so yeah yeah sandra's my partner she's uh yeah she's amazing all the way through the journey she's been incredible really she's um yeah and we, we've kind of done a lot of changes ourselves as well you know but when we met we were both uh, i was going traveling actually just as we met um and she decided to um sort of go traveling um, at the same time as well and sort of quit her job um and then a few few years later when we were still together and i decided to get into property um she decided to change her career that she'd been in for years as well um so she's done the same thing and just kind of created her own di completely different career so we've always been there for each other and kind of pushing each other on and happy with the risks and you know just 
helping each other through. So had you gone traveling before you had your, you, you, before you were stabbed? Um, yeah, before and after, actually. Yeah, I went twice okay. a few months, yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, how did you approach, because obviously, you know, you've not done much in property before, uh, you, you know, you've done... You've done a weekend. You've read some. You've read some books. How did you go about identifying um, your your first rent to rents? Um, so yeah, I think I, I think I actually went on like a one day course for that um, for the rent to rent stuff, um, and I was working with someone else as well, um, a business partner then, Faisal, a friend of mine. Um, so we did we did this together. Um, yeah, and we, I think at the time there was quite a lot of kind of basic and free information about rent to rent, and it's not okay. it's not particularly complicated. So it's one of those things where we just you know get out there, start start sort of um, putting ourselves out there with the local agents. Um, and Faisal, my part, uh, business partner for the rent to rents, um, he had a few buy to lets locally, so he knew quite a lot of the agents. So that was our kind of that was our in and, and got us some credibility to start with really i was going to raise that with you because obviously sometimes people get going and don't haven't done anything at all it's how do you come across as congruent credible uh, for people to take that chance on you originally but yeah. clearly he'd use some some existing uh some existing relationships so had you set any criteria for for the rent to rent sam initially um so first of all yeah we were looking for um yeah a minimum of four bedrooms was our thing back then um that was what we were looking for and um, the bigger the better really because obviously yeah you know, once you go it t tends to be like the three rooms would cover all the all the costs and then your your extra room was was your profit on the, on the rent rent um and then you, if you could get you know a a, a big three bedroom house with maybe two reception rooms plus a kitchen downstairs which is quite common in kind of Victorian houses in London, then they'd be really profitable. So that was the kind of thing we were looking for. Um, but we did take on um, yeah, a, a flat as well that became a four bed flat. Um, so a bit of a mix really. Uh, at the time there was, the room rates were quite high and, and they were rising quite rapidly around that time. So um, you were looking to do these as, as HMOs because you've got the 90 day rule in London, haven't you? This was a long time ago. So this is before that really. Yeah, okay so this before the 90 day rule yeah 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 so quite a long time ago now um so yeah that was just um as i say quite a, quite a basic strategy just to get going um because i didn't have much of my own funds i just had you know a few thousand um just so i could get started on rent to rent but the goal was always to do development because of my background um you know that was what i was interested in really was doing projects around london but um obviously need plenty of capital for that so that was something i was lacking um straight away so yeah so, once i sorry so the projects that the initial rent to rent that you secured take take me through a couple of them did um did they require much uh much refurbishment work what what's what was you know what the numbers what was the investment required how, how did that work um well, it's a long time ago now <laughs> um did you have to do much to them there was a mix again really there was one of them we spent quite a lot of money on we i think we spent about six or seven thousand on because it had had um students in there for about five or six years and the landlord hadn't been there once during the the years oh, wow. <laughs> yeah so yeah we spent uh quite a bit on that one we yeah there was a uh, i think it was about a thousand pounds worth of kind of skips and crap that came out of the house <laughs> to get it okay, even so and we I take it Thessal, it. Thessal obviously was a big part of, of of helping with with this initially as your business partner yeah yeah, yeah. um yeah but obviously with me kind of taking on the refurb stuff because that was what I was you know that's my experience um so yeah we we did that one um that was quite a good one I think the rent on that one was we got that fixed for five years that one um and that was fixed at 1900 and I think we were averaging about uh between eight and nine hundred a month uh, profit on that one right okay and that, that grew quite nicely through through the five years so that was a good one um, i mean obviously it was going to, so if you were doing profit 800 so your first 12 month first 12 months was basically about paying back the costs that you'd invested 
Yeah. Um, and then your next four years, obviously, was was really more more. Well, your profit or for you, probably, obviously, your living expenses, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, just for the first yeah, first couple of years while we got it going. Yeah. So that right. Was, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, how many rent to rents did you do, Sam? Uh, we got up to five. Um, okay. Yeah, they were between sort of three and five year contracts, um, and. Yeah, the we had another couple which were well. One was completely refurbished, brand new flat, um, so that didn't need any work at all. Just a bit of furnishing, so that was quite an easy one. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, a bit of a mix really, but all around South London, you know, in Clapham, Streatham, um, Polly's Wood, um, just around the corner from me in Tooting. Um, so all fairly local um, and good, um, good tenant profiles as well. Everyone was really a young professional, just come out of uni, or maybe they're in their late twenties and they're just sort of saving up for their houses, so uh, for deposits on their own houses. So they're always paying on time. Didn't want to run up arrears. We, we never had any late payments or anything like that. So that's good. And were you self managing, Sam? Yeah, we're self managing. Yeah, that's yeah. It, yeah. I mean, that's the thing with rent to rent. You don't always have a lot of surplus really to to pay an agent do you it really cuts into your, your profit if you if, if you start to do that yeah that's it and um and probably about a year and a half into it i started doing my first yeah two years into it i was doing my first development so i didn't really want to grow after that i got to the stage where i kind of right i've, I've covered my basic costs here so i'm you know i'm safe here so okay. now it's time to sort of focus on developments so after the rent to rents, what was the what was the next project for you? What did you go into? So that was a Victorian house that I did, um, okay. which was yeah a two bed Victorian that I um, sort of took it back to brick, did a single story rear extension and the loft. And, and how just just before we get into the what you did to it, just take me through the the acquisition, the procurement process. How did you locate this this deal? yeah this was through a friend of the family this one um okay. so, yeah so they were looking to sell um and were happy you know with the with the price that, that someone got one of them got in touch with me to say yeah you know, sam sam's in property you should speak to him um and luckily yeah it was um the perfect kind of project really where it's just a you know good area quite close to the tube um and yeah it was um quite an easy kind of process to buy it um, and i did that with um with an investor that I had again that was a it was a friend of a friend um and they had some some money they wanted to invest and it was just kind of an introduction really um that came through so, them. so the price that you negotiated with with the with the vendor what was that a, a you know sort of an open market value price was it did you get yeah. it, it it was open market value yeah, yeah that's it yeah yeah right okay um how long did it take for the purchasing process was it quite quick at, at that point in time yeah it didn't take too long at all it was about three months something like that right and what what year where were we with this in terms of timelines so that is, is that early 2016 or is that 2017 okay so that right okay so we're going back a few years yeah, yeah. so uh you did the purchase what what were your plans what what were you going to do to it to add value yeah, so fairly straightforward because it needed a lot of work, hadn't been touched for a, for a, a good few years. Um, so it was really, it was a back to brick um, refurbishment, um, adding two bedrooms in the loft and then doing a single story wraparound. So uh, extension on the ground floor. Uh, so that was, um, yeah, your stand, standard kind of London Victorian house, really, where you've got Did the you kind of... planning for that, Sam, to do the... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it was permitted development for the loft um, and then, yeah, just straightforward planning for ground floor extension. So did you apply for the planning uh, as as the conveyancing was in, in, in progress or did you wait until you completed on it before you applied for the planning? Yes, yeah, I did it while it was in progress, actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. So, so how long did it take to get your planning through? Planning was very straightforward, really. It was, I think it was eight, eight or nine weeks. So, oh, yeah. so it probably yeah. came through around about the same time, did it? So you hadn't got any yeah. major delays yet. No, that's it, yeah. So um, you did back you did back to brick. You added two bedrooms, an extension. Um, did, were you doing all the work yourself, Sam? No. Um, so when I started, because of my previous issues and my physical stuff going on, I, I decided that... Um, 
you know, if I was going to do property development properly, I didn't really want to even be involved in the day-to-day -day management because I don't really enjoy that. I've done pro project management, not particularly fun. I wanted to be, I'll, you know, I'd be there regularly and doing it, but I didn't want to be employing subcontractors and being there every day and having to chase people up all the time. Right. Um, don't enjoy that that much and I'd rather pay someone a bit more money and be able to scale the company that was what I was planning to do okay. um, so and, and again working on the tools just wasn't part of that um, I couldn't say no to doing the windows though because obviously with my bit of glazing background I did for a few years it's hard it's hard to pay someone the amount of money they want for uh, Victorian sash windows sometimes so I did that I, I, I thought I did that with my mate um, and rather than it costing about I don't know, seven thousand or something that I was quoted for it. I, I bought the windows for just over two thousand, um, and I paid my mate two hundred pounds to come and work with me for the day, and we fitted eleven windows in a day. So in a day, wow! Yeah, we okay. ripped the old ones and fitted the new ones all in a day. So that was a little saving I couldn't say no to. But yeah. well, yeah, absolutely, yeah, probably <laughs> saved yourself over what? Uh, um, yeah, at least five grand. Really. Five grand, yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So, um, so what how did you obviously if you weren't on the tools and you weren't managing what how how did you put things in place what what did you do to create that that structure if you like that that team yeah so funnily enough the uh the builder that i got for that was um he was outside um when i went to have a first have a look at the house um and i i knew there was a good chance i was going to buy it um he was working on the opposite side of the road um and i went to have a look at the job and he said oh, i've got another two i can show you if you if you want so he was kind of first fix on this job another 20 doors up he was a second fix and he showed me a finished one another few doors up so i thought so i said to him okay how much how much will this cost and he told me and i said yeah that sounds about right um and that was the builder i found for it so <laughs> right okay yeah. uh, so it wasn't somebody that you already that you already knew no not for that one no um no, yeah, to didn't. be honest a, a lot of my contacts because um i'd only lived in london for a few years then a lot of my contacts and you know building contacts were all kind of friends from school um, and contacts from when i lived out in farnborough in hampshire so um i didn't really have that many building contacts unfortunately um to, to bring into london um i can occasionally drag some people in into southwest london but most of the most of my mates that live uh, out in Hampshire don't really want to be driving in all the time. <laughs> no, it's a bit it's a bit of a commute, isn't it? it? Doesn't really make it worthwhile. So, what sort of contract did you agree with the builder? What was it? You know, fixed price, JCT. What what was the arrangement between you? Um, yeah, it's just a straightforward. We did it on a JCT, um, and yeah, he was yeah because he knew his prices so well. It was just a yeah very straightforward jct contract right. uh, yeah um and i just did the normal you know i'm the client i buy the shiny things and you buy the building materials um and and that was it really that's that's always what i've wanted to do in my projects you know i, I do get involved in them and you know, I'm, I'm just not like i'm not there very often i'm always quite involved but i really wanted to hand off a lot of that kind of day-to-day -day stuff that can yeah you can just get so busy with that kind of stuff and it's you're not really adding a lot of value um so what if, are the bits that you take control of um sam what are the bits that you actively involve yourself in yeah obviously uh, I, overseeing it week to week um but mainly just um the design really layouts designs um i am helping there because because of my sort of very background i'm always sort of guiding builders on what to do and the kind of finishes i want um okay and often how to do stuff as well because you know, i've got a particular way of doing stuff i, I used to work in a lot of high-end properties um around kind of ascot and wentworth and those kind of places so okay. when it comes to the finishing details are something i'm really big on um so yeah give, giving the builders a bit of guidance day to day but really kind of you know letting them take care of the job themselves um week to week um with me just sort of going there once a week that was my role sometimes twice a week if i needed to be there but that's always the role i've kind of taken really. so how did you approach things like purchase of kitchens bathrooms who who, who did that how, how did that process work yeah so that was all me really um and yeah back then i used what's the what's the company that everyone gets the cheap kitchens from what are they called lmpg magnet and southern yeah that's it yeah yeah so i used them for my first couple of projects actually where yeah, the, the design was a bit more of a kind of, yeah, 
simple design i guess no, nothing too kind of individual um nicely finished projects but when it came to the kitchens and bathrooms i kind of utilized their the buying power they've got for some for some cheaper deals right i mean the great thing about magnet and southern with L and pg is that there are different bands so if you want to spend more money on something yeah. uh, as an end product you know you, you can do um yeah uh yeah I, i'm a fan of magnet and southern kitchens as well yeah. so can you remember what um what what you refer budget was on that first property sam um i haven't got the i've only got the total cost here um I, I would be able to say i know my total costs for the whole project were at 190. i think the refurb budget was like 120 130. um what so I've got, did you pay for it uh 370. okay you bought it 370. okay yeah yeah um, i mean obviously we can get the breakdowns of some of these yeah. following up anyway so so what what did you come out with profit wise on that one did by the way did you how did you you mentioned you bought it with an investor so yeah. did you buy it cash or was it financed yeah we got that financed yeah okay so did you do it on bridging yeah I did it on bridging yeah yeah so the investor put the i'm assuming the investor put the refurb money in did they yeah yeah they, they put in some refurb money it was just kind of we, we knew what we wanted to do on the kind of on the on the co what the costs were going to be so they put the money into that um, and obviously covering some of the purchase price and i put some, a little bit of my own money into, into that one as well okay. uh, so yeah the the gdv on that one was um 729 okay did, did you keep it and refinance or did you flip it yeah i've sold it on yeah straight yeah. away okay yeah. so you sold it on straight away yeah, yeah that, that was always my goal um especially doing some rent to rents you know i obviously see the value around keeping properties and renting them out but yeah it's just, i've always been someone who just likes to trade things that's that's what I was, always what i wanted to do um i didn't really want to build a, a rental business um especially where i lived in london because you know the yields just aren't that great a lot of the time right. um but it's always my intention to to sell on really okay yeah. and, and the arrangement with the investor was that was that a fixed price return arrangement or did you do it as a jv yeah that was a fixed return on that one yeah okay yeah. okay yeah yeah okay yeah. so uh so you sold that one um so sort of start to end what how, how long did that take you from obviously um you know from 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 the completion through to the sale what was the timeline you were working on uh it was so we started the first week of jan i remember because i was away snowboarding first week of right. jan um and then yeah we it was on the market and it sold within uh, like like the first day it went under offer the first day um and that it went under offer i think in september um but we didn't actually you know, usual sales fun and games that didn't uh there was there was a small chain um so it didn't actually complete until like the first or second week of december so yeah 11 months essentially just under 12 so months I'd, I'd you just thinking of your bridging did you have 12 month bridge on it uh yes yeah, yeah. okay so yeah because that's sometimes the thing that catches people out if they're selling something if they're flipping and they've had it on bridging if they go beyond that bridging they get hit with quite severe penalties yeah you know they'll yeah. another five seven grand on on top of the bridging sort of thing uh you know for for the privilege okay so that was your that was your first project back in 2016 yeah. 17. what did what did you go on to next sam so after that um i decided that that was a good project um you know good return you know just under 170 grand profit nice um and but I could see what was happening around me. And I've been to see quite a few more projects that I wanted to buy similar stuff, but I, you know, the market was starting to um, go up a bit. And there was, I could just, you know, there was a lot of competition for developers in my, in my area as, as there is in most places. Um, and I could see that the margins were going to be dwindling and I knew I needed to do bigger projects. So with, with bigger profits essentially um and higher margins and doing things like converting houses to flats um you know your kind of typical large 
sort of London Victorian house, which is 150 to 170 square meters. Um, you know, dividing them up to a three bed on the ground floor, a two bed, and then a one bed in the loft. And that's quite a common thing to do uh, near where I live. Um, obviously, there's not too many open green fields up for purchase to build new houses on <laughs> in southwest London. Um, so, yeah, a lot of conversions um, and the odd sort of commercial to resi opportunity as well. Um, I didn't have the funds for that. So, I knew I had to get to work on raising finance. Um, and so what I did was I took on two small um, projects, which were just um, refurbing flats. So um, one was a studio flat that I just moved the um, kitchen. It, had, it was a really nice layout. It was only about sort of 37, 38 square meters, um, but it had it had the kitchen um uh, in a perfectly well-sized what, what, what turned out to be a bedroom is like a three meter by three meter kitchen um which is quite large so i moved the kitchen into uh, what was the studio room um and yeah turned that into a nice little one bed um not not high profit margins at all um but i did another one another one which is a straightforward one bed refurbishment back on the market so i did two of them um at the same time because i knew they wouldn't take up a lot of kind of mind space for me i'd just be able to focus on raising finance so i could then do the projects i wanted to do um so yeah at the same time as i was running those two projects um i yeah started working with um a, a, a good friend of mine now and a new business partner alistair um who was coaching me on how to raise finance so so before we get on to that, the, the one bed, oh, sorry, just let me plug in. I do this, all the, I thought it's a charge, but sometimes it <laughs> charges and I've not switched it on there with me one second. Um, the, the, one, the one bed that you did, did, um, did you have to get planning for that if you were making any changes to it, Sam? Uh, no, no, there are, I didn't have to do any, um, any planning with that kind of stuff um yeah they were pretty 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 straightforward um, right. I'd, I'd looked in some of the other um yeah flats in the building um and they had all um i think some of them were originally one beds um so i don't know if this person had changed it to a studio that was a one bed i, I don't know it's a bit of a weird place when i bought it to be honest but yeah i didn't have to do any planning so it's really straightforward kind of in and out um you know, refurb done in eight weeks and then back on the market with those two properties so you turn them around quite quickly again yeah. what was your purchase mechanism for them um so one of them was with cash um and the other one i used bridging for right okay same yeah. sort of yeah. thing again yeah, yeah. Same sort of thing yeah so um, well so uh obviously whilst that was going on you sort of were looking at how do you go about raising um raising finance yeah, yeah. so yeah. you mentioned you'd got a mentor at this point had you you were working with a mentor yeah how had you found your mentor incidentally what was your criteria for finding your mentor um oh, there was wasn't really anyone um around doing raising finance stuff that everything i'd seen in property was um find the deal and the money will flow um yeah. and i always just thought that sounded like nonsense to me <laughs> it it can work but i just thought I was, I was always i think if you've got if you've been in property for a few years then you can make that work and you can probably find the right person for it but you know i think there's a lot of jv's gone wrong and the wrong money for the wrong deal that has happened and um, where people are they find a deal and they go out and they try and get the money and it you know you're in the get mentality yeah rather, rather, rather than trying to find someone who might want to work with you on growing your business and doing the kind of deals you're interested in doing and then you come to an agreement and then you go out and raise finance and you kind of go shopping is what i call it you know because you've got the finance agreed and you you know this person wants to work with you or multiple people want to work with you and then you go out shopping for deals and I, especially when it came to you know if you if if you can find a great deal and you've been working with an agent for six months and finally you get a deal which works with them and they you know you build up the trust with them and then well what if you can't find that deal uh if, what if you can't find the money in like a few weeks that you need it 
or you know the, one of the deals that my, one of my first deals that came up once I got finance agreed. Uh, we we looked at it and we agreed the price like ten minutes after viewing it, um, and then we exchanged within like two two and a half days. We exchanged. Um, wow. Okay. Yeah, and that was on like a property that was worth like eight hundred and thirty five grand. Um, and that turned out to be a really good deal. And you, you can't you can't do that if you haven't got the finance behind you first. So, so how how well a couple of things. Obviously, um, where did you find your mentor initially, and was he the one that helped you with um, going about looking at getting the investor on board? And then we'll talk about what you did about securing the investor. Yeah. Um, so I found him just on yeah, it was just online really. I think they're posting various stuff about what he was up to at the time okay. um, in finance. Yeah, um, yeah, and as I say, there wasn't many other people talking about it. It was all kind of yeah, raising finance always, and it still is. Uh, from what I see, a lot of it's it's a bit of a when it comes to training in property, um, it seems to be like a, a a byproduct or something you just do. There's there's not a lot of focus on it, whereas I think there should be a massive focus on it because. When you boil it down you only need two things in property you need cash and you need a deal um but a lot of people are spending a lot of time looking for deals and then the raising finance is a bit of an afterthought um and i just think it should be the other way around so i, I get where you're coming from because i work with people with mentees and sometimes that um if they've got a deal trying to find the finance uh becomes a bit of a head blocker because they're mm -hmm you know that 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 they're worried that they're not going to uh, they're not going to find um get finance so you know when they're looking for deals well what if I get a deal you know all, all that sort of uncertainty that goes on you know goes on in the head as you say so that that can affect people in that way yeah so yeah. so you worked with your you worked with your mentor what were some of the key things that you learned from this mentor about raising finance what were the key messages for you that you got from this um the big thing that was i think is a was a blocker for me was really understanding my value and what i bring to the table okay um, that was the, that was something that was going to hold me back and it did even during the process where um alistair was coaching me um but he coached me really well on it so i got over it but one of the big things was just was that imposter syndrome um it's under so for me i always just felt like I felt like I was going to be asking people for money, even though you don't have to. It's all about having a conversation. Um, and I'd learned all this stuff, but I just still had it in my head. I didn't like fully, fully understand my value and what I brought to the table. And it's not until we went like really deep on that and did a lot of coaching on it that I was like, ah, now I get it. Now I, now I really understand on a deeper level what I bring to the table. And, and why that's of interest why that that would be of interest to an investor so it wasn't until i sort of did the coaching because you can give anyone a process can't you but a lot of people can't actually then go and do the work because there's something that's stopping them absolutely and i see this all the time you know having the um you know having the the understanding of what what you need to do uh, the knowledge it's all about the application yeah yeah, that's, you know, that's when it becomes problematic. Yeah, you know what you should be doing, what the application, whether it's running a project, whether it's raising finance, whatever it is, this is where people fall down. You know, they've got the flow chart of what they need to do and they know all that and they can articulate all of that. Yeah. But actually putting that into practice is something else. Yeah, and quite often it's just those, um, you know, it's just those negative thoughts that our minds like to try and spin us and tell us is the truth like we can't do it or you shouldn't be doing this or you know all those things that pop up in people's heads yeah um, just essentially it's just our brains trying to keep us safe because we're going out there and doing something new so they're just trying to keep us where we're at that's how the brain works so it's uh you know it's a constant work to sort of take those thoughts and go right um thank you for the thought brain i'm going to put that to one side and i'm going to do what do what I want to do. Thanks. <laughs> so once you got over, you negotiated these blockers and understanding your own value. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what was your approach? How did you then go right? Okay, I get this now. I'm now going to go off and find an investor to work with. What What was your plan, Sam? Yeah. So it was going out to people that I already knew, 
um, that was the big thing really. Um, going out to people I knew, um, people that I'd already worked with before, um, or they were friends, friends of friends. Um, you know, one person was a developer that I worked for um, when I was doing carpentry work at, um, at their commercial conversion they were doing actually. Um, right. Yeah, so that was when I was still on the tools and I hadn't spoke to them for a few years. Um, but then, yeah, just got back in touch with them um, because, you know, I, I've sort of said, you know, I'm not, I know you've done plenty of development before. Um, this is what I'm up to, you know, is it something you might be interested in? Um, so it's really just having kind of conversations to to gauge interest, not offering anyone anything, not not blindly offering percentages or any anything like that, just really um, getting in touch with people, letting them know what I'm up to um, and just, yeah, meeting up and meeting up with people, having a chat um, and discussing if there might be an opportunity from working together at some point. That was really the, the basis of it. Okay, and then so the the investor that you ended working with uh, obviously came as a as a result of some of this activity that you were undertaking. Yeah, take take yeah. me take take me through how that how that happened. Um, so with this person, I yeah, so I, I sort of sent them a message first of all. Um, I was actually speaking speaking to one of their friends as well, and um, one of their friends wanted to invest, um, but they were off on holiday for a few months. Um, so he said, oh, maybe you should speak to speak to my mate who, who you know from doing the development. So, um, yeah, went and first first port of call really was to just text him just to see what he's up to, say hello. Um, and then we had a then we had a phone call between us just yeah, having a catch up, really. Um, and then once he said, yeah, you know, this, what you're up to sounds really good. I might be interested. Uh, we met up in a pub and I think before so the conversation went uh once once we started talking a little bit more about sort of the details of the kind of specifics of the the projects that i was looking to do because i hadn't done any of these kind of projects so i'm probably going to talk about where i'm converting houses to flats um but that was the kind of project that i wanted to do um and yeah just gave him a, a few an overview of what i wanted to do in the next few years really um, and he said, okay, how do you normally fund these or how do you want to fund it? And I said, well, you know, normally I'd be doing this much on the purchase price with cash and then we need some for the build and then we'll get bridging on the rest. Um, and he actually just said to me, well, how about we just um, scrap all of the uh, scrap all of the bridging and the lending and we'll just do it cash. And I said, yeah, that works for me. <laughs> right. Okay. So did he become your JV partner rather than yeah? yeah. Yeah, because I think if people are doing that, they get to the point where they they want the pound of flesh, don't they? Really, in terms of the profit that's coming out, yeah. Yeah, and and to be honest, I I prefer doing that as well. I because um, it's one less thing to think about is interest payments ticking over, whether that's from a, a bridging company or whether that's from a private lender. Um, and he's he's he had experience anyway in in doing some developments. He's not done a lot, but he's done a couple. Um, and I saw that more of a, a, a good share of um, skills because um, he actually um, does quite a few of the things that I don't like doing where he's actually quite into numbers and he's quite into his spreadsheets and all that kind of stuff, which I'm a lot more into now because I've learned to do it. Um, but he's he's big. He does all his own accounts. He runs it by an accountant, but he's self-taught and he's, he did all the VAT returns and payments for the builders and everything when we were doing our first project. So it was a real JV in that kind of terms um right yeah so yeah worked with him on on that first project and as i say we're so i didn't have any projects live for him at the time because i wanted to get the get the agreements first with people um which i think is just it's just a much better way and less less risky less stressful way of doing things really is get the, so what, get the agreements with people what was your what what was your first project you did together then as a jv uh, so that was in Tooting, um, just just around the corner from where I live. Um, so that was the one I just mentioned where we, um, I was offered the project. So it's a funny story, actually. I was actually, I was selling my flat at the time that I just finished uh, doing, uh, my own personal home. And I got all the agents around for the, uh, the initial viewing so they can have a look around. And yeah, told them a bit about obviously just seeding, seeding myself as a developer in the area, just getting my name out there. 
Um, and as I went to um, hand in the keys, um, once they were ready for viewing, it's like a week later, one of them was standing outside the agency. Um, I was just having a chat with him. And he said, oh, I might have some, uh, a deal coming up um, pretty soon if, if you're up for it. It's the kind of thing that you'd be into, I think. And I said, yeah, okay. So he told me the roads. And as soon as he told me the road, I, I, knew, the, I knew the property. I know the prices they sell for and I know exactly what the project is. Um, and he, yeah, he told me and I said, okay, what's the price? Um, and he said, uh, 835. And I said, okay, I'll take it. Um, and that was on a Friday afternoon. Um, we went around to view it on the Monday, myself and my JV partner. Um, and then, yeah, as I say, we, we got the offer accepted. Well, we just said, yeah, we'll, we'll pay that for it. Um, and yeah, exchanged a couple of days later. And then, of course, you've you not got to get planning on this either, had you? Yeah, this thing we needed to get planning. Oh, on you did time. get planning. So, did yeah. you know that you you'd, you'd be able to get planning, Sam? Was there any element of risk with that, or had all the properties in that area already got planning? Yeah, so there was a risk with what we were doing. So the project worked at your standard kind of convert the house to um, three units: the three bed, two bed, one bed. Yeah. Um, but and and that was in that was written into local policy. It, everything we were going to do fit within local policy, which is um, it, the house has to be over 150 square meters. You have to have a three bed with a you know family unit with a garden yeah. on the ground floor. Um, so we could have done that, um, and that was the fallback position, and that still would have been a good um, good project. But uh, one of my friends had just done a project around the corner um again same same kind of road as like a few you know Vict victorian roads stacked up and he yeah. just done one exactly the same kind of house he'd had to go to appeal to get it but he had altered the level slightly um and he'd gone for a he dug down on in the, into the basement and done a three bed um two two what well, a two bed and then two one beds so he played around with the levels raised the ridge on the roof squeezed uh, the ceiling heights on the flats and he managed to get four out of it um, and he'd had to go to appeal because it was against housing mixed policy um for converting houses to flats um but it was a bit of a ludicrous policy where they said if you have over three units um in converting a house to flats we want two of them to be three beds and it's like oh, that just doesn't work in converting a house to flats um and the inspector really was quite sort of uh uh well he said wandsworth policy was pretty stupid <laughs> not in those exact words but in in the report he said you know this policy is pre pretty crazy especially because you're right next to a tube station right next to a hospital park you know you you, you the fact that you can just have a, uh, you should have another three bed in there with um you know it's just pointless you know who wants a three bed with no garden in the middle of london um it's a pointless policy to have um so we went in for we did a three-stage planning process for this one so we did permitted development to do um, the roof and to do the loft um, and then we did um, a full planning application to do a side return and three meter extension on the back of the house um so we did that and what we did after that is we started building so we haven't got permission to change it into flats but we know um when we start building we make all the um extensions we make all the exterior changes then all we're doing then is we are applying for permission to um change one family home into four units no external changes so that alleviates the 500 neighbor complaints <laughs> that might come in well you, you can't stop them you know you you might end up a committee you don't know but essentially you're just applying for change of use really at that point no external changes right because uh, you've already done the external changes anyway yeah and the external changes would have been the same um if we'd have if we'd have ended up keeping it as three units, which we know we could have well, got. Well, just to explain for the readers and the listeners, what, what was the difference between doing them as separate planning application? Because you'd still need to make a set of changes to facilitate your your end strategy. So what, what was the difference between doing them in split phases? 
the main thing was to save about twenty five, twenty seven thousand on sill. So oh, we've done, okay. done all the extensions, um, just under still classed as one household. So we've made all the extensions and external changes. Um, then for we're applying, yeah. then we're applying for one house to four flats. Then no extensions, so you're saving twenty five odd grand on sill. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so was it if you went over three to four, sill kicked in for this particular area? Is that correct? Uh, no, the the sill was there just with the amount of um, extension we were doing. Um, there was sill there, so you would have had to pay that for the for the new new flats we were creating. Obviously, the increased uh, increased floor space. Right. Okay. So the 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 other thing in here that that comes across is that you had a very clear understanding of the planning, uh, um, you know, the 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 planning policy in this area, and you know um, the effects of sill and all those sorts of things. So you're able to navigate that in the right way. Did you work with a planning consultant or an architect, Sam? Uh, I did for this, but. Beforehand, I probably went through at least 200 planning applications in Wandsworth um, to, to go through all of it myself, so I know myself um, before I start doing a project like this. I want to know the ins and outs of all of it, um, how the, yeah, what the officer's language is, is languages, um, yeah, all the terms they're using, because, you know, I don't, I don't, at that point, I'd only done um a couple of straightforward refurbs and extensions before that so okay. before I, b before i you know took my opportunity if you like out to um potential investors and jv partners i did all this work where you know i i just i'd spent countless countless days going through and understanding what the officer's language is what well, okay that's policy 3.47 about bins you know and i'd hop onto the local plan and have a look about the bin policy and what's that they're talking about and all of those different things. So I went, I, I, I always go really deep on that stuff. So I get a, a really deep understanding of it. So I know the ins and outs of it. So I know, I know where the risks are. I know if, you know, if, if the, if the language has changed, because uh, quite often there'll be, there'll be changes in policy that aren't, you know, they don't update local planning policy. You know, a year or two after they've done it if there's small changes they make and you okay. can only find out about those small changes from the applications from the applications where the officer language changes or they start refusing things for a, a reason that they would have wouldn't have had a problem with a couple of years before so you it's like pulling that all of that information together you can only get that because a lot so, of a lot of, even with like planning consultants and architects you know they don't know that stuff they miss some of that stuff so you really have to be on top of it when you're doing developments. You really need to find all this out yourself. You need you can reference it and and speak to planning consultants about it. But I found that quite often they didn't know some of the some of the nuances that I found out and okay. they weren't aware of. I found that in a couple of different things. And another one we'll probably get onto later is doing um, commercial to resi and yeah, uh, some something to do with how much you can reduce a shop by in Wandsworth that isn't in policy, but I found it um, on one application only uh, in my searches. Right, so that's yeah. outside the normal the normal rules, yeah. 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 So I think that the lesson here is what's coming across is that you did an awful lot of due diligence. This didn't happen by accident. You know, you've done a lot of due diligence researching the strategy that you wanted to um, focus on and understanding all the, the 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 nuances and what what you could do what your minimum exit was you know the standard three uh yeah. you know three unit approach and then you know um you know the other the other options about you know digging down and and the way that you structured all submitting the planning i mean that's all you know that 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 that's all really quite important stuff to you know to mitigate some of the things that you've talked about so i think that's a really important lesson to to raise with people um Definitely. so just conscious of time so um once you've done all that so you you did turn this into something that was four was it four floors effectively on the development when it was finished yeah that's it yeah yeah uh, and what was just sort of quickly um so i mean you you did quite a lot of work so you separated them all you created four separate different flats was that with different numbers of bedrooms etc 
Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so we did a um, yeah a three bed, um, two two beds, and a one bed in the end. Yeah. Okay, and did you sell those some, or did you yeah. do rent them? So you sold them. Again. Yeah, yeah, sold those all again. Um, yeah. So that one, the purchase price was eight three five. Um, costs were seven eight five. Um, obviously including build, stamp, everything else in that. Um, GDV was two point one six million. Um, so the profit was five hundred and forty thousand on that one. Nice, nice. Yeah. And how long did it take you? Because uh, oh, you you got the planning requirements and things as well, hadn't you? Yeah. So that was. It took us about nine or ten months to start work. We had a bit of a nightmare with Party Wall um, on that one. Um, we had to put like sixty something thousand in escrow because we were doing underpinning. Um, yeah. One neighbour was a nightmare, one neighbour was quite nice. Um, so we had to end up in very protracted and expensive party wall negotiations um, with various engineers involved. Um, we ended up putting yeah, 63,000 in escrow um, just in case we caused damage to any of the properties. Um, and then about a nine month, nine month, 10 month build. Um, right, okay. property, properties went on the market. They all sold within yeah, a week and a half, two weeks. Um, that was during COVID. Um, oh yeah, nice, nice return on that one. Um, yeah, so very, very off. nice return. Yeah. Had you split, did, did you have to split the titles because of the leases as well? Yeah. So yeah, all new leases drawn up. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then um, obviously, um, yeah. Okay. Great. So let's just quickly before we finish um, touch on your commercial Terezi project. So uh tell me tell me about that one what year can you remember what year this one was the commercial Terezi? uh so that was pretty much the same time really um as as the conversion of the house to four flats so you were running them in tandem yeah pretty much yeah i bought it about five months after so they're pretty much and i got started a bit quicker so they're pretty much run, running in tandem so what what was the project what was the commercial Terezi project so this was a it was a diving shop with um with uppers um it had a res residential flat above okay uh, and fairly straightforward planning just uh full planning to convert the loft so i could make the existing first floor flat into uh two beds over two floors um and then pd to convert the shop into uh yeah two bed two bath flat right. Yeah. And you mentioned you found something out about how, um, how you know, how, how much you could do within the shop that wasn't policy. Yeah, so this was another deal I did, which was a post office um, where um, I knew a few people that had looked at it locally and it was on the market for a few months. Um, I wasn't looking to buy anything at the time, but I ended up looking at this place. Um, and I knew from all the research I'd done on um, just looking through planning applications really just hour after hour of doing it um, that there was an opportunity to um, reduce the size of the shop you could definitely get two bet two flats at the back of the shops um, but you could also reduce the size of the shop um, to the, I think the minimum square meterage is like 27.5 square meters that Wandsworth would allow you because it was in a secondary shopping area so they wanted okay. to still maintain right yeah yeah they wanted to maintain that um so yeah made the shop smaller and that allowed me to get an extra flat so i could get three flats on the ground floor maintain a small commercial at the front uh, and then i was able to also something i'd seen done a lot as well where I'd just keep the existing resi on the first floor um, and then i got a one bedroom 47 square meter flat in the loft as well so that went from commercial on the ground floor to um three units plus commercial on the ground floor and then another two units above it um and i actually sold that one that was a post office i bought i actually sold that with with planning um, okay so you didn't build that out you just got planning gain on that one yeah just planning going planning uplift on that one and sold it on um but the other one that we just spoke about i built that one out um at the same time yeah as i say as i was doing the other flats for well okay yeah. so are you still working with your investor sam uh, yep, still working with them. Uh, but um, uh, to be honest, uh, after I did the uh, after I did the post office, um, and I flipped that on, um, and made some nice money doing that, um, I started doing uh, option agreements um, because 
I could see where the money was and, and the money was and, and what I loved doing was planning. Um, and I'd had quite a tough time with the various builders, a lot of stuff going on with uh, with the with the builders that I've used, including electricians coming in and cutting wires uh, once flats had been plastered and us having to redo a load of wiring because the builder hadn't paid the electrician. But had you paid the builder? Yeah, I paid the builder. Yeah, 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 uh, okay. yeah. Yeah, so I, and I, quite a few other problems um, that made it quite tough to actually finish those projects and yeah, a lot of stress, put it that way. Um, so yeah, I, I, after that, I focused on doing option agreements um, and I've had yeah four of them on the go for the last couple of years. I've just exited one um, and yeah, that's something I enjoy. I, just, I love the planning side of things. I love the detail. Um, it's not easy. It's quite quite tricky. Um, but I love the detail of it and I love the design side of things as well uh, and working with good architects and good consultants. So, so where are you finding these uh, these option agreements, Sam? So I've been, um, they're all around near me, um, southwest London, and I, I started working a bit more towards Croydon. Um, so there's a bit more opportunity there, obviously, with you know, houses on bigger plots in that area, uh, a bit more green. Um, so I started working in Croydon a couple of years ago. Um, but I was finding them all on using Land Insight. Okay, so yeah. you're direct to vendor. Yeah, all direct to vendor. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and just yeah, using option agreements, and then yeah, I've, so I've just exited the first one there, which was um, there's a small land assembly of um, two gardens next to each other, so two houses at the end of a close, and there was sort of an opening in between the two houses. Um, so that was my sort of pathway in, and they both had huge gardens. Um, so they've, they've both been left with sort of two or three hundred square meter gardens each they've got left. But I've managed to um, yeah, buy sections of both their lands um, and get planning for six four bed houses in there. Nice. Um, so, yeah, I've just exited that one. Uh, that was a good one uh, in a tough market as well. It wasn't easy to wasn't particularly easy to sell that. It was a nice site, lovely location. But. Um, I got planning middle of last year and yeah, not a great time to be selling after and then all. You sold that on with the planning game to a developer. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sold that to a developer, yeah. So that one was purchase price for that one was um, 804. Well, I've done it on, on option 804. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, I spent like, the, the sale price was uh, 1.3. Uh, my total costs were ninety thousand, so yeah, just over four hundred thousand profit, four hundred and five thousand profit on that one. Nice. Just for flipping that one on. Um, so yeah, looking, I've got another one that's uh, at appeal at the moment. It's not been an easy time in Croydon because just as I was submitting all my or well, three applications, um, they had a change of mayor that came in and he revoked all of the planning policy guidance i'd design my schemes around um, oh, no nightmare and, and, and plus the the council also went from being probably the most pro-development council in the country to uh, i would say no to 98 to 99 percent of all developer style applications every month for about six months they weren't even doing committee because the committee would just say no to everything um, all of a sudden, so they weren't even doing committee. They were just refusing everything for a few months. Um, but luckily, um, yeah, I had to wait five months to get into committee because they said they were going to um, approve it, but it had a few a few objections. So I got into committee. I waited five months to get into committee, um, and eventually, um, yeah, got it through. And Croydon said yes to one of the is one of the only backland developments they've approved in about a year and a half i think there was well, a couple more so quite an achievement <laughs> yeah so, bit of a journey <laughs> what, what, what's your plan now uh, sam what are you going to continue to to focus on in the in the near future so for now i've got another i've got my another one that's at appeal at the moment um i've got one just around the corner for me um which we're just getting into legals at the moment um which is another one that's going to be nine units um in southwest london and the one of the owners that I've just sold on his site for uh, site with the one I've just got planning on in Croydon, um, he's got a large um, commercial space in Croydon, 
um, which is you can get about 30 to 33 units on it. Um, so we started working on that just recently. Um, and also, yeah, working on um, building up uh, the Raising Finance Club, which I started with Alistair. Okay. Um, so yeah, working on that at the moment. So. so lots, lots of things going, lots of things going on then. Yeah, not not too much. It's all right. The uh, now I'm not building at the moment. Um, it's a lot less time consuming doing property. You know, option agreement. Yeah. Not yeah. without stresses, but it's the day to day is a lot less. You know, manic. I would say. <laughs> right. Okay. And that's yeah. what your focus is going to be, sort of the planning gain approach and for, for, for now, yeah? Yeah, that's what I really love. Yeah, I really enjoy it. So that's what I'm focusing on at the moment, yeah. But I dare say I'll, I dare say I'll get back into building at some point because um, I do love it because of my background. It's good fun. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Um, when the back. time's right. So when you're not doing property stuff, I know you've mentioned, obviously, you're a, you're, you're a, you know, you're a winter sports person. So in, in addition to snowboarding, what, what other things do, do, do you like to be doing, Sam? I'm a mad keen fisherman. Okay. Mad. Oh, yeah. no, you don't do the pictures on Facebook. Like <laughs> <laughs> So we uh, oh, uh, don't, don't request me on don't request me on Facebook, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> you'll see you'll see some pictures where I've just been to France and I've posted up a few pictures from there, just me holding big carp. So like very little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and yeah, that, you know that takes up uh, any t any free time I do get. I love to go and do that for a, quite often is two or three days at a time. So I don't go that often at the moment. I've got two young kids, three and five years old. So Oh, okay. So yeah. yeah. Plenty of time for them. But they they love their fishing as well actually. We're off to uh we're off to the Cotswolds in a couple of weeks with uh with them. Um where we got we just get a lake and a lodge to ourselves and they they absolutely love fishing in the outdoors. So yeah. Oh great. So keep it in the family and then you can all um you can all enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, exactly. So, it, I mean, you've done some incredible stuff, Sam. Um, you know, what for you, if you were to give one piece of advice to somebody that wanted to start out in property, what what would that be? Mm. I think it's don't be don't be led by the potential returns of any strategy. Go with something that you think you've got good skills that you can apply to that strategy and you think it's going to be enjoyable and, and fun. To really yeah. work within flow sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. really. Because um, whatever strategy you do, it'll, every strategy works. Uh, every one of them can earn you money. So yeah. go with something that you think you're going to have some good skills to put into it or, okay. or, you, or you just – or it's got a real – it's got a real pull for you other than just the money okay. that's the thing because because it isn't easy there's a lot of ups and downs and it's stressful you know I've, I've become a lot more you know when i was building out a lot more anxious and stressful than i've ever been um and, and that's yeah it takes its toll on you so if you are doing something just for the money then i think it's going to be a lot easier harder. to burn out and just so uh, you'll find it a lot harder because you don't deep down even when it's tough you you're not you don't really enjoy it that much you're just doing it for that thing for the money so i think find find something where you think okay uh, there's a good chance you've I'm got some passion about it as well basically yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah. if you don't no. like it don't worry about changing i'm always i'm always changing and evolving and adapting and kind of growing so yeah if you go and do something you don't like it don't worry about it just change and do something else that was, yeah. <laughs> don't stick with it just because you've learned about it and you put a bit of time into it yeah you know it's yeah it's a long life a long working life and we spend a lot of time doing it so if you don't like it just change and don't worry about it go and do something else okay no that's that's great advice um thanks for that sam and thanks very much for your time uh right i'm just gonna just gonna stop this now so just just bear with me one sec um Thank <laughs> you.